Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. More saving, more doing. This week, we talked with one of our listeners about some repairs that are necessary on a gunite pool. Gunite pools are great, but you start getting a small crack, that crack can get even bigger, which means a real big problem. So we try to head it off at the pass. Yeah, that's the kind of uh, repair that you want to make as soon as possible, right? Because it's only going to grow larger, and next thing you know, you go out there and you have a concrete pit instead of a pool. (laughs) Um, We're also going to talk to a, um, a homeowner who recently cleaned her wood deck and wanted to know when it's safe to apply a semi-transparent stain. Because if you apply it too soon, the, water, the wood is still wet, it won't soak in. So we've got a couple of tips for her. Also, a very interesting gutter problem. Boy, I tell you, every now and then uh, a, a homeowner will ask us a question that really takes a little head scratching, and we definitely had one on this week's show. And I've got a simple solution, actually two simple solutions, on how to remove pet hair from carpeting and upholstered furniture. Boy, there's a lot of things we have in this podcast. Certainly glad you're with us. Let's get started. So tell us here on today's homeowner how you're spending your weekend. Are you taking on a project you've been wanting to tackle for a while, or are you just taking it easy and um, just kind of getting rested up for the next week? Either way, we're certainly glad you're spending some of your weekend with us. And as we always guarantee you, I guarantee we're going to be able to provide something to you that you'll really be able to use uh, this weekend at your home. Right now, we're going to try to help Jack out. Jack uh, has a little problem with a swimming pool. Tell us about it, Jack, and welcome to the show. Okay, thanks for taking my call. Certainly. I've got an in-ground granite, uh, not granite, excuse me, gunite uh, swimming pool that is about 20 years old. Pool works fine, no problems. Good. What has happened is over the last couple of years, the joint between the coped cap and the tile on the side has opened up about anywhere from an eighth to a quarter of an inch. So I got some grout repair in a little plastic tub and tried to shove it up in that thing to seal it up, and it kind of falls right back out. Mm -hmm. It's very, very hard to put in. What I'm looking for, I'm envisioning a grout repair stuff that might come in a tube or a caulking tube uh, where I can just get in there and squirt this stuff into that little space and wipe it down and make it pretty. I haven't been able to identify that stuff yet. So so the gap you're speaking of is uh, under the coping and above the tile, the vertical tile. Okay. Yes, sir. Above the water line, right, Jack? Uh Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, that'd probably be four or five, six inches above the waterline. I'll tell you, you know, I would really be looking for a commercial level type of caulking, and I agree with you, a um, a grout repair caulk would be a great way to go. Um, Joe, I would actually have to think that the pool supply companies, the Leslie's of the world and places right. like that, uh, would be the w- w- would probably have some of that type of repair material. You would think so, Jack. The fact that the gap is about eighth to a quarter inch absolutely says fix it with caulk, some kind of caulking, some kind of sealant, uh-huh. flexible sealant. You know, if it was wider than quarter inch, then it's like, oh boy, now what do we do? Because you know, most caulks don't hold up very well when the gap uh-huh. is much wider than a quarter inch. So I would definitely, as Danny said, um, I mean, I, I suppose silicone, one hundred percent silicone, work clear silicone. I would just put it in there, but stop you know by a pool place and just ask them or give them a call see what they recommend but i think if you can get that joint clean and dry 100 percent clear silicone in there would be what i would probably try and in this case you can do a relatively small section and see if it works you don't know, have to do the whole pool okay just one other part of the question sure. um i have in the past repaired uh, little cracks and gaps around the back of the coping where it joins the concrete with a right. material that says self-leveling. Will yep. that work on that joint up underneath it, or will it just come right back out? It will come right out. Yeah, self. I love self-leveling caulks and sealants, but they only level out when they're on a flat surface. Yep. 
not vertical. Okay, so go for a silicon caulk and squirt it up in yes. there. Yeah, and that yeah. way you can and inject it in there, and it gives it something to to really hold well. And I, you know, the good the 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 thing about this, I start to say the good thing, but it's not good. But the thing about it is, this is a common problem that a lot of people deal with, and I guarantee you, those pool supply companies will tell you what you need is this is proven to be the best, and uh, you know, some type of marine caulk, I would suspect, because of it being in such close proximity to the water line, that um that will do it. Probably a couple tubes will make it all the way around that pool, and it'll give you an excuse to get in the pool, won't it? <laughs> i tell you what, these hot days, I don't need much of an excuse. <laughs> I, I bet, Fellas, Jack. thank you very much. Hey, our, our pleasure, Jack. Thanks You're for welcome. being with us. If you have any other snags on anything around your home, let us know. We'll be glad to help. Thank you. Okay, take care. Have a great weekend. Well, you know, um, I, I can kind of see some of the same things uh, in a lot of pools where just, well, you know, pools are notorious for settling. You can see right. why with, you know, thousands and thousands of gallons of water and the weight that yep. comes along with it really will test any situation like that. Um, but, you know, those cracks and things like that, it's always better to catch them early. If they start really gapping and start really shifting, water's going to get underneath those cracks. And that's the same way it is with driveway side walks everything if there's a crack there seal it so that more water doesn't get under there and cause some significant settling yeah i've um you know i've seen and swum and enjoyed gunite pools which are like concrete pools sometimes it's called shot creek pool that's right uh-huh. my whole life but i had never seen one installed until a few years ago my neighbor and good friend had one put in so i want to go over and see it what an amazing process it, it, it is I mean, amazing just i mean dig a hole line it with rebar and they come in with a hose and they just shoot concrete i know and it, hold on and they're guys in there walking around with trial it, it's just amazing and hold on to the ho- hose and the way that you're having <laughs> yeah. to, to to do that yeah it really is a challenge now you know if you're think of um thinking of uh putting in a swimming pool you really need to take um you know like you do with any um, person doing work around your home. You want to check them out thoroughly, get plenty of references from friends and acquaintances. Uh, you want to check and make sure that uh, they do have all of the proper license. And you definitely want to go look at some of the pools they've completed and talk with some of the owners because it's a significant investment, especially if you're going with a gunite or shot creek type of pool. Uh, you really got to look at it yourself to make sure the quality of one is up to your standards to make sure you're getting everything just right because like like Jack said, you know, the pool is has is working great and it's 25 years old. Uh, you don't want a pool that only lasts a few years when you're spending that kind of money. Of course, I see a lot of people uh, in the north will, will um, basically use the above ground pools so that they can take them right. down during the summer. I yeah, mean, during the winter, rather. Mm-hmm. During the winter, yeah. yeah or um, where I grew up, um, as a kid in Connecticut, there were a lot of above ground pools before people started putting in in ground, but the above ground pools, they used to take them down. Then I noticed they would leave them up throughout the winter. Uh-huh. I think they used to put like big inflatable things in the water uh-huh. and cover it. Oh, I'm not okay. sure what that did exactly, but the pools lasted and then the, in the, when spring came, they just take it off and... Start using it, clean well, it, and I, use it. Well, I have seen hundreds of videos along the way on, on the Internet of people that I guess were abandoning the pool and decided right. to cut the side of it or and, right. and, and ride out with inner tubes out in the yard. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Get now, washed down the yeah, hill to their neighbors. They're property, having yeah. some fun right there, but uh, I think that probably ends up with a more damage than they imagined with that amount of water yeah, rushing out Yeah, where's all that water go? Yeah, I know. Well, it's, uh, if it, your downhill neighbor would be would I know, love exactly, that right into someone's living room. Yeah. Let's see if we can help Don. Donna now. Donna's in Missouri and uh, uh, contemplating getting that deck looking good. Donna, welcome to the show and tell us all about it. Okay, hi. Um, this deck is 20 years old. It's, old. it's got sentimental value. I'm going to try and hang on to it. Mm-hmm. I put the wet and forget on it. My question is, when can I start staining it? Okay, all right. Well, um, has it ever been stained before? Yes, it has. We had a product called Wood Renew put on it. That was the last treatment we'd ever had done on it. Okay. And so, and then that was, I'm going to say, seven years ago. I see. So what does it look like right now? Um, Wood Renew, I'm not real familiar with. I don't know if you are, Joe. I assume it's... I am um, not, no. Hey, um, I assume it is a um, type of coating instead of some type of stain. Is it a brightener, so, does it, maybe, or a stripper? Oh, so they they kind of. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Is uh, that might be what they did? Is the, the, did it kind of uh, clean it and brighten it, or was it actually yes. some type of coating? 
that it was like a deep cleaning, and it brought it down to the natural wood, and right. there was a sealer put on it also. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm not sure. Joe, do you think that uh, she could, with, with it being that many years, that she could possibly do a little bit of sanding, lightly sanding, and then possibly go with semi-transparent? What do you think? Yeah, well, um, Donna, so right now the sealer they put on is a clear sealer, I assume. So there's no stain on the deck right now, just a clear no, sealer? No, there's nothing on it right now. It's just the bare oh. wood. Oh, good. And this is pressure-treated wood, I assume? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know if you even need to seal to sand it. I would just stain, you know, if you want to change the color of it, which I'm assuming you do, then um, Danny and I always recommend a semi-transparent stain as opposed to a solid color stain or an opaque stain, um, and certainly not any kind of deck paint or anything like that. The semi-transparent stain is goes down really easily. It allows the wood grain and texture to show through. Um, and unfortunately, with opaque stains, they're a little closer to paint. They have more pigment, so sometimes you have the, trouble, the same problems you have with paint in that it starts fading and it peels so i would go with semi-transparent and it, you ask when to put it down you can put it down yes, as long as the deck is dry oh the real dry okay all right that answers my question but, but one and danny other, will give you yeah. a quick tip on how to test that <laughs> that's right one one other thing that i would uh, suggest just get a, a glass of water any kind of water and pour it on several different areas of the deck and see if it just just ponds up if it just you know beads up or if it actually soaks into the wood. If it beads up, I'm afraid your sealer is still um, there, and that's where a little bit of sanding will be necessary. Not a lot of sanding, but just enough to get through to that grain. Uh, but I suspect that's already has worn off, and you'll find that that water will soak in fairly well. That's an indicator that it's time for, uh, to put on some semi-transparent stain. Okay, very good. Well, good. Well, Donna, thanks so much for being with us today, and uh, hope this works out well you, well for you. If you run into anything else, just let us know. Thank you very much. Okay, our pleasure. I'm sure your husband will appreciate you taking care of that deck. Too. That's right, absolutely. I'm sure he would. <laughs> okay, thank right. you. Absolutely, You're thank welcome. you. Yeah, that's good then. You know, you, you certainly build up a, a lot of emotional ties to homes. And, you know, when you see something like her late husband building a deck like that and, uh, sure. you know, to be able to uh, take, uh, continue, uh, you know, to make it last as long as possible, that's a, that's a very uh, sweet thing to, to think about and a, and a great project to, to take on there. Let's see if we can uh, jump over to Michigan and visit with Margaret. Margaret, welcome to the show. Thank you, Danny. Good. Tell us what's going on there. A little uh, erosion. What's going on? It's pretty big erosion. It all started with a ground bee nest that I eventually had to basically burn out with kerosene and a light. And, but it's just kept eroding ever since that broke into the ground. And I'm just trying to figure out how I can patch that up. I'm thinking rocks and then brown dirt and then um, seed. I, I just don't know what to do with it. Okay. Well, um, a lot of times when you have, you know, just like uh, when they're doing work on the highways, they mm -hmm. use uh, erosion cloth. I have some of that, but it's such a deep, hollow where it eroded that I need something to fill that, and that's uh -huh. my problem. Yeah. Well, um, if you were going to try to um, grow um, any type of uh, vegetation on it, like grass, of course, you want the best um, soil that you can put in there. Of course, the best soil is going to be very loose and light and very prone to the erosion damage. But doing that and putting the right type of erosion mat on there, um, uh -huh. and then you're able to plant, sit, plant the grass seed in there, and there's a lot of fast-growing grass seed that's only temporary. Uh, the ryegrass and different types of, uh, I'm not sure in the Michigan area, I know there would be one. I know winter rye would be one, but it's uh, right now it'd be too hot for that. But um, you right. can still put some fast-growing grass that will die out while the more permanent seed can uh, be put in. But, uh, Joe, I'll tell you, another thing we've seen a lot of people do is use erosion cloth or something similar to that and then put right. a ground cover in there like jasmine or something else along those lines. Yeah, oh. something that won't won't erode. Margaret, so this erosion isn't called caused by road runoff or anything like that, like water no, washing down. No, no, no. It's, this was it's just... right from the road. But, no, right. that darn oh. Venus started it all was so deep. Okay. Well, well, that, that'll that make it a lot easier to repair. I have a concern at the end of my driveway where it's road runoff, and I've 
fixed it four times and now it's already washed away again. But um, uh. so what I would suggest, since it's just the bee's nest that is now gone and left the uh-huh. void, I would dig it, it all out, dig out as much as you can, pack it in with some gravel, some so- topsoil to grow grass, and then plant whatever you can get to grow there. It could be a ground cover, okay. it could be grass. The good thing is autumn is the best time of year to plant grass. So we're coming up on okay. that in another month or two. Okay. So um, of course, you'd have to keep the dirt from washing away between now and then. But I think that would be and the I, best thing. And since this is only from a bee's nest, not runoff from the road, I think it would be, right. once you get it filled in, I think it'll be easy to fix it. Okay, that's what I wondered. I thought rocks, but I really didn't know. And then I thought, well, you guys sounded so professional. I thought, I better check this out. So <laughs> thank <laughs> well, you so thank much. You. Well, it's all, okay. it can always be a challenge, you know, and in, in when you have the erosion like that. But if you think about doing the ground cover, maybe a great long-term solution. And just check mm-hmm. with someone at a local nursery there that can recommend the right type of ground cover that will work well, you know, there in okay. Michigan. And uh, and best of luck to you, and thanks so much for being a part of the show today. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Okay, very our pleasure. Thank You're you. Welcome. Yeah, the key there is to dig out the whole, all the void because if you don't get down to like solid surface, it, solid dirt, you're going to have that caving in at some point. Boy, you never this time of the year uh, to to uh, accidentally dig or chop or disturb some of the yellow jacket nest or wasp nest, ground wasp, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, that can certainly mess up a good summer day right there. That's a uh, bad surprise. That's a bad surprise, exactly. Hey, it's time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. You know, one of the most common bad energy habits is leaving lights on all day. You know, we all forget about flipping the off switch from time to time. But now, thanks to Philips Hue LED Smart Wireless Lighting Starter Kit, you can flip the switch without even being in your home. So forgetting to turn them off isn't really that big of a hassle. This kit contains four white and and color ambience hue bulbs with a hub that allows you to control lights with voice or a smart device from anywhere in the world. You can customize your daily routines, use preset shades of white light to help you energize, concentrate, and relax throughout the day. Let hue wake up wake you up gradually for a fresh and gentle start to each day instead of an abrupt alarm and relax with a cozy warm light gradually turning off as you fall asleep boy how about how about that i'm getting drowsy just listening man i'll tell you that is fantastic uh just kind of knows what you're thinking it seems like but for more information on phillips hue led smart wireless lighting starter kit log on to home depot Dot com, all part of some more smart home technology that's sneaking in and uh, yep. starting to uh, be uh, very mainstream. I'm, you know, as I'm moving along on my house, so much of the smart um, smart home type devices are all wireless. You really don't even have to anticipate yeah. a lot of those things. Like yep. you used to have to run five miles of wires all over your house. Um, now, such a, so much of the wireless technology, with a little bit of wired here and there, um, it's going to make it very easy to, to have a house that you can control fairly easily. Yeah, I mean, between the smartphone and the wireless technology, I mean, you can operate your house. You don't even have to go to your house anymore. <laughs> As Danny said, anywhere in the world, it'd be fun to turn lights on and off while your wife's sitting there, Danny, trying to I read know. a book or oh, something. I know. She would know exactly where that's coming from. So. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Joe, when you think of uh, relaxation, let me... Uh, okay. Uh, Jim is uh, joining us right now from Virginia. And listen to this note. I live in a small town in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Now, doesn't Sounds that like just relax of a novel. Yeah, right off the bat, you're just yeah, relaxed. Like Jim, looking forward to talking to you. Uh, tell us what's going on there in the in the wonderful town that you live in. Well, hello, Danny. I appreciate your taking my call. Certainly. Yeah, I've got a uh, a gutter that is condensation drip coming from it. Uh, the strange thing about it, we just finished a 12-day heat wave, and it didn't occur during those 12 days. Hmm. But prior to that, well, it wasn't every every night or every morning, but... Oh, I say several, two or three mornings out of the week. I would get up. I get up early, four thirty-five o'clock, and get the early morning newspaper. Mm-hmm. Go out my door, and there's this big wet spot on the concrete and drips coming down from the gutter. And uh, about nine or ten o'clock in the morning, it'll uh, it'll slowly stop, and the sun comes out, and it'll eventually stop, and the sun will dry it up. Right, right. I'm just wondering what's causing that. Wow, you know, I was uh, I was at a hotel recently, and I saw just one, you know, early early in the morning going out, and just seeing one downspout dripping water, 
and it was a, a you know a pretty day. There's no rain overnight or anything like that. And um, come to find out, not that I was investigating it, but I just happened to notice out the out by hotel window that it was the air conditioning uh, condensation line oh, yeah. was yeah. being fed into there. And so you know, but uh, that's probably not the case in in your situation, Joe. What do you think on that? Uh, do you think that they could possibly be just condensating like that uh, to create that much water and that much dripping? Yeah, Jim, is this happening just in this one spot on your gut? Yes, yes, about a two, hmm. two foot, two foot section. Yeah, well, it certainly, as you mentioned, it certainly does sound like condensation. You know, dripping off the cool aluminum surface. Then when it gets the sun warms it up, it, you know, the temperature changes on the gutter and it stops dripping. But I'm not sure why it would be that one place unless it's um, in the shade more, so it's. You know, it stays cooler longer than other sections of the gutter. I mean, you that could you, be you think there's a chance that some somehow air conditioning somewhere along the line or, no. or leakage touching that in some way? No, this is it's in the, my kitchen area. Um, I step out my front door, and I got like an 8 to 10-foot little porch there. And as I step off the porch there, there's, there's where the drip's coming down. Is there an attic right behind uh, this? Yes, yes. Can I, yeah. I wonder if you went up in there and, and poked around and make sure the insulation's not stuffed in there and blocking any up, flow I just, of air. I was just up there the other morning, early, before it got hot, and right. there's nothing there. Nothing there. Huh. Wow. You can see the salt. Well, even even the, if, yeah, excuse me, Jim, I was going to say, even if we decided, okay, it's probably that condensation, you know, because it's cool in the morning, what are you going to do about it? I mean, you're not going to, you know, yeah. heat up the gutter in some way, you know, so... I'm not even sure what I'd tell you. It's kind of like when a toilet sweats so much it's staining the floor. You can introduce a little warm water into the water supply so the toilet bowl water isn't so cold. It's a little warmer. It warms up the china, and it doesn't drip. But in this case, yeah. what are you going to do? You know, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I don't know. Like I say, we just finished a 12-day, uh, 90-degree-plus day, you know, a week, and uh, every morning it was fine. But then prior to that, oh, several weeks before that, I would go out, and no, oh, I wouldn't say every morning, but uh, oh, maybe two or three mornings. You, you, there, the wet spot is, and the drip coming from the gutter. Wow, boy, oh boy, Strange. that that makes me so uh, curious as to what that could be. I'm not. I'm afraid we can't offer you a whole lot of solutions on it, but. Uh, uh, I just I'm not sure exactly what that could be. You know, certainly um, if you can divert that downspout, reroute it or to uh, put in another one that would uh, take its place to keep it from being deposited right on that spot on your driveway or, yeah. or, or walkway would be good. But that's kind of an extreme measure, really. Yeah, well, it's like a, it's not actually the downspout. It's like a straight, just straight gutter. Right, it's the gut, the rain gut. Oh, I see. Wow. Again, I, wonder, I wonder if this would be an interesting experiment. If you took some... Um, half-inch styrofoam and just sort of temporarily, like maybe five or six feet long, and glued one at the bottom of the downspout and one against the front edge, if you could, like the in, we're talking about inside the gutter against uh -huh. the uh -huh. front wall, because that would, would protect it a little bit and keep it a little warmer just to see if, I mean, I don't know if you could live with styrofoam in your downspout because it would be blocking stuff, but I'd just be curious to see if that would warm it up enough you know, protected enough that it's not getting cool and it's not dripping. Well, that makes me think about a coating inside like elastomeric. Elastomeric mm. is, a you know, yeah. something that works great on, you know, um, of course, a fairly thick material, but you still can paint it on fairly, um, you know, thin on the inside of the gutter that would add to um, protecting it from any leakage, but also would provide a little bit of thermal protection to maybe be just what you need to uh, keep that condensation from happening. Uh, I think that's what I would try. Yeah, okay. Because you, you can buy just a gallon of the last American, a throwaway brush, and that won't take you long at all. Yeah, okay, I might give that a try. All right. Well, good. I hope that works. That's another good luck, another Jim. another mystery there that you that you find from time to time on different houses. All right. Glad to be with you and glad to have an opportunity to introduce my buddy Joe Truini with yet another simple solution. Okay, Danny. If you live with dogs or cats, you know that vacuuming alone doesn't always remove pet hair from carpeting and upholstery. So here are two tricks to try. This is actually a two for one simple solution. You can use a long-handled rubber squeegee, right? You can buy like a window squeegee and you, you can thread it into a like a, a pole that, you know, mm -hmm. handle for a broom or a mop, something like that, screw mm -hmm. it in there. 
and you use that to rake. It's basically the same motion as raking leaves, and you can rake the hair out of carpeting. There's something about the squeegee and then being that rubber uh-huh. fin on the squeegee will just rake the hair out. Now, this is after va- vacuuming, too. If you tried after vacuuming, you'd be surprised how much hair you pull up because it just sticks to the carpeting and the, the vacuum can't pull it out. Okay, but what do you do for upholstered furniture, couches, chairs, that kind of thing? You can't easily use the squeegee. So here's the, here's the simple solution. Put on a pair of latex rubber gloves, and then you just very aggressively rub the upholstery. Huh. And it's kind of like raking it with the squeegee. And it's just something about the, the texture of the rubber will just take the fur right off the hair, that? the pet hair, right off the fabrics. Wow. Off the fabric. Try that, and you'll be surprised how easily that works. There you go. That's a great simple solution for anyone that's battling those uh, uh, cat hairs, dog hairs, that type of thing. Good, good. You can. Uh, and if you I, don't uh-huh. think there's hair left behind after vacuuming, try one of these. Yeah. And give us a call. Exactly. I'll tell you, you know, my um, my daughter Melanie is so conscientious of her young uh, fur son, um, Ollie, um, who's a, <laughs> I uh, want to explain a, a golden retriever um, who she absolutely loves is a comfort dog. She had it trained as a um, it was trained as a comfort dog to go around the hospitals. And she takes oh, it really? every couple of weeks and, uh, oh, that's great. and get, puts his little handkerchief uh, around his neck and takes it to the kids' homes and different elderly uh, facilities and all that. But Golden Retrievers will uh, uh, share some hair with you. And so she takes <laughs> in her suitcase when she comes to visit us, and right. I assume other friends, her Roomba. So she puts her Roomba she carries down. A Roomba she carries around. a Roomba with her because she wants to make sure she doesn't, you know, cause a problem. And she puts the little indicators around the areas where Ollie will right. be. So, and Ollie's used to it, like, there's that menacing little thing again, running around, <laughs> bumping into things. But a very, a very, very uh, conscientious way could there. Could just tie the Roomba to the dog. Let I know. Just drag it could around. Could do that. Just dra- <laughs> <laughs> but we all love our pets, and we'll put up with a lot of things like that. But your Absolutely. simple solution certainly helps uh, solve that problem. And, again, Again, like I always uh, will remind you to go to todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions and just check out some of the their 60 second long videos, almost 500 of them waiting on you. You'll start watching those and you'll just keep clicking on the next one and the next one and we'll keep rolling right along. And also very, very soon we're going to announce the relaunch of todayshomeowner.com. Brand new website, all the same content and a whole lot more, many, many more features that we'll be able to help you even more with the information that we can provide. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. You can send us your question at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Barbara from Kansas writes, Hi, Danny and Joe. My front entry door is installed a little too low. I tried putting the thinnest carpet pad in front of it, but it still does not clear the door. I have hardwood floors and my door is made of wood. I've had this problem ever since I moved into my home in 2013. Can this be corrected, and how much might it cost? Thanks a lot for your show. I watch it every Saturday and follow on Facebook, obviously, watching the the television show. That's that's awfully nice. I've seen this problem before that uh, it's not that the door is too low in terms of being installed improperly. It's just just that clearance level because so many times – you know, um, when you have an entryway to a door, you usually have a step up there anywhere from three inches to inch and a half. So there's plenty of room there for any kind of, um, you know, welcome mat and so forth. But in a situation like this, um, well, I mean, uh, the only thing I can think of, Joe, is you don't want to have to raise the door and alter it and everything. It's a wood door, so the door right. could be carefully cut which would require the threshold uh, to be replaced and increased in height. Really not a a hard project at all since you're dealing with wood. Yeah, that's that's the first thing I thought when Barbara mentioned it was a wooden door. It's like, oh, well, thankfully it's not a steel door, a fiberglass door, because you can't can't, uh, cut it very easily. But, yeah, I would just cut the door as you need to. You can mount on the inside of the door. At the bottom you can mount an adjustable door sweep that will accommodate any any changes in the floor height, if that's still an issue. And in extreme cases, Danny, I mean, I, I wouldn't suggest it here because the door sounds like she's not complaining about the door, but if you're going to replace the door and that's always been an issue, mm-hmm. you can install an outswinging door as long as there's room outside to open it. You'd hate to do that because ordinarily entry doors swing in, but I mean, that's one way that might be uh, to save someone else who has a, it would be a lot of work and expense to change the door. But in this case, 
I would just cut the door. She'd have to get a, you know, a carpenter who's who's pretty experienced to do mm-hmm. this, but I, I don't think it's it's an un, insurmountable problem. And, and we have a we have a video right on todayshomeowner.com to show you the safe way to cut a door without any splinters. So fairly easy project, but if you haven't done it before, uh, something very common for a handyman. Uh, service to be able to provide for you, but and be sure you cut the bottom, not the top. Yeah, I'll have to <laughs> I've say. I've seen that before. Well, take a door down, put it on saw horses, go have lunch, come yep. back, not be thinking. Yep. Cut the door, put it in. So it's still binding on the bottom. You need to look up, and there's a two-inch gap. I really thought you weren't watching me that day, Joe. I really <laughs> thought I had gotten away with I that. I saw the videotape. Yeah, it's on well, Amazon Prime. Yeah, but well, no. you know what I did is I took the piece I cut off and I nailed it back on. <laughs> that was You're just real. rotating the door piece <laughs> by real. piece that so it wears really evenly. That was yeah. really good looking there, I'll tell you so. Well, we all make mistakes sometimes, but you just keep plowing away and you learn from your mistakes. Hey, we want to tell you that if you'd like to send us a question, please do so. Todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. While you're there, feel free to mention any subject that you would like for us to cover on the podcast. And we've got thick skin. If you've got some recommendations on what we can do to make the podcast better for what you do, let us know, and we will certainly listen to each and every one of those suggestions. We'd also like for you to write us a favorable review. That's the way the podcast works in order to get more people uh, aware of the Today's Homeowner podcast. We certainly appreciate that, and we appreciate you taking some time each week to be with us here on the Today's Homeowner Podcast. We'll talk with you soon. I'm Danny Lipford, along with Joe Truini. Hey, Danny, I cut it twice and it's still too short.